Take your hymn book and turn to hymn number 259. Hymn 259, Jesus Saves. Hymn 259. We have heard the joyful sound. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Spread the tidings all around. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Bear the news to every land. Climb the steeps and cross the waves. Onward is our Lord's command. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Let's take a moment and shake a few hands. On that second, wafted on the rolling tide, Jesus saves, Jesus saves, tell to sinners far and wide, Jesus saves, Jesus saves, sing ye islands of the sea, echo back ye ocean caves, earth shall keep her jubilee, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. On that third, sing above the battle strife. Jesus saves, Jesus saves, by his death and endless life. Jesus saves, Jesus saves, sing it softly through the gloom. When the heart for mercy caves, sing it in turn for the tomb. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. On that last, give the winds a mighty voice. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Let the nations now rejoice. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Shout salvation full and free. Highest hills and deepest caves. This our song of victory. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Amen. All right, we're going to go ahead and uh, have a word of prayer for the offering, and we appreciate just how the Lord continues to meet our needs. Brother Marty, if you'd come pray for the offering today, that'd be great. Again, we are certainly grateful and thankful to the Lord. So many wonderful blessings. Brother Marty, you pray for the offering, would you? Our Heavenly Father, in everything, let us give thanks. And in this offering today, whether it's a small offering or whether it's a big offering, let us give it from a thankful heart, with a cheerful heart, with a heart of faith. In your wonderful name, amen. Thank you. May be seated.
Well, let's all stand. If you're able to stand, that is, and we'll do our course today. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing, I will sing. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord. With my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness, thy faithfulness. With my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness to all generations. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord. What a great little chorus and just uh, expressing the need to share our wonderful joy and just uh, hope with the world through our lips. The mercies of the Lord, how wonderful they are. Let's sing it together. Ready? I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing, I will sing. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord. Oh, with my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness, thy faithfulness. With my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness to all generations. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord. Thank you. You may be seated. What has happened to a nation that used to fear the Lord? To a people whose foundation was built upon God's Word. We've allowed the world's opinion to chart a different way. But it's time the church of Jesus Christ should boldly stand and say, God's Word will stand against the raging tide of those who criticize and work their evil plans god's word will stand against the gates of hell with power to prevail in the hearts of men god's word will stand They can take it from the courthouse walls, remove it from the schools. Teach our children that we're animals, speak against the golden rule. Try and hide our Christian heritage from the public eye. But they'll never overcome God's word, no matter how they try. God's word will stand against the raging tide of those who criticize and work their evil plans god's word will stand against the gates of hell with power to prevail in the hearts of men god's word will stand it is forever settled to evermore endure it's the only way a sinner's heart can ever be made pure god's word will stand against the raging tide of those who criticize and work their evil plans god's word will stand against the gates of hell with power to prevail in the hearts of men, God's word will stand. God's
God's word will stand. God's word will stand. That's a good one, ain't it? Yeah, like that. That's a good song, considering what we're going to talk about today. Take your Bible, if you would. Turn over to the book of Mark, Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9, verse 24. Mark chapter 9, verse 24. I'm going to read a verse, and then we'll give you a little bit of the background of it, and then we'll just talk a little bit about uh, just, um, I guess, an issue that concerns me a little bit and bothers me, um, and I'm concerned for others as well. I um, was going to, I, I was felt led last week, I was real close uh, when to, to preaching this message last week, and it, uh, the problem was I had no verses or anything. I didn't hadn't prepared it or readied it in any way, and I just was on stage. I felt like this is something we need to address, and so the Lord gave me liberty to preach what I'd already prepared. Praise the Lord for that, and uh, at least I felt a lot better about that. And uh, but if He wanted it, it would have been okay because it's not about eloquence. It's not about what I share. It's really what He does in our hearts and lives that matters. And so whatever he wants is good, but he gave me a week to kind of look at this and to at least mull it over and think about it. And like everything else I do in life, I complicate things. It was real simple last week, okay? And uh, I complicated it. So I'm going to ask the Lord to help me to go back to what the simplicity of it was, and we'll see where it goes. But Mark chapter 9, verse 24, uh, the Bible says this. It says, And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. So a man approaches Jesus with a child, his child. And the Bible says in Mark chapter 9, verse 18 through 19, it says, And wheresoever he taketh him, he teareth him, and he foameth, and gnasheth with his teeth, and pineth away. I spoke to thy disciples that they should cast him out, and they could not. He answered him and saith, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. We note the condition of the child. It was a desperate condition, a very difficult one indeed. As a parent, to see your children suffering like this and to be put into danger on a regular basis would be extremely horrifying. And we see this man now very desperate. He approaches the disciples and he says, Listen, I've got a problem with my son. And there's this spirit that tears him. And he finds himself being cast into the water, cast into the fire. And I need help. And they say, I'm sorry, we can't help you. But Jesus shows up. And so the man approaches him and Jesus makes it a point to say, oh, faithless generation. I think now we're going to see that he's going to address this issue of faith. He's going to try to help us with this area of faith. And may I say, it wasn't just this man. It's going to be throughout history, mankind, that's going to struggle with faith. So while Jesus is being introduced to this child, the Bible tells us that the Spirit tear him. And in verses 22 through 24, we read, And oft times it hath cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. And straightway the father of the child cried out, our text again, and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. How many times have you and I prayed this exact prayer? Maybe not those exact words, but virtually the same exact thing. Lord, I do believe, but boy, I'm struggling right now. See, doubt is not new. It's not new at all. Even during Christ's earthly ministry, there were those who heard his words, those who saw his miracles, and yet they struggled with believing. In our text, a man, of course, has a son who's tormented by an evil spirit, and he, he himself is tormented by doubt. Doubt can be exhausting for a man or a woman who experiences it, who struggles with the existence of God or the Bible. 
It can be exhausting. We're trying to desperately believe. We're trying to be all in, and yet we struggle to do so, and it it just is exhausting. I am convinced that doubt has its roots much deeper than most would imagine. I'm talking about in the church, in at least the house. I'm convinced that many struggle with believing in God. I believe that many struggle with believing the Bible is the Word of God, and as a result, they struggle with their own personal salvation even. And I want to ask three very important questions this morning. I believe questions that are literally life-changing. And so, we'll have a word of prayer, and we'll continue this morning. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity we have to be here. Now, Lord, we know that without you, we can do nothing. You are the vine, we are simply the branches. And I'm asking you to fill me with your Holy Spirit. May I be literally just a mouthpiece today. May you stand in my shoes, and may I just be a conduit of your grace, your love, your reality. And Father, may you just anoint every listening ear as well, and may we hear with spiritual ears. Oh, Father, may you reveal yourself to us in a very, very unique way today. God of heaven, we need you. We need your presence even now. We need your power to change lives. Lord, if there are those that are not settled on their soul salvation, that do not have confidence that heaven is their home one day, may they, before it's eternally too late, make a decision on behalf of Christ and trust and receive him as their savior and ensure that their eternal destination is solidified and settled. O God of heaven, do a miracle now in each of our lives. We'll thank you in Christ's name. Amen. Now, on the stage today is a lie detector. It's amazing what technology has done for us. Technology has taken those major large machines and it's kind of enabled us to do things that we could not do before. A little computer now has a lot of power. You connect it to the right probes and things, all of a sudden you can... Use it. I, I'm not good with my password, though. But other than that, I'm, I'm good. <laughs> I, I'm still struggling here. I, I'm going to get it. There you go. Have you ever had the cap lock on? Uh, that didn't help either. There we go. All right, good. All right, so we're going to go ahead and put this thing in place and get everything fired up and, and ready to go. And then we'll be ready to roll here. All right, I've got the probes here. I need to place them on somebody. I need a volunteer, actually. If I could have, um, sorry, brother, why don't you come on up? And I'm going to ask uh, just a couple of questions today, this morning. And um, just have a seat right there. And so I got to get in. No, you can't. Don't don't cross your legs. Sit back, please. That's right. This is this is scientific. Uh, Okay, here we go. Okay, this is going to happen here. Hold on. It takes a moment to set up, but you'll see here in a moment how important it is. And so we're going to get you all set up here. First of all, I need to, these are going to be cold at first, okay? I'm going to put them in from the back so you don't have to kind of be dealing with them the whole time. But here, I'm going to put them right here. I need to put them, actually, oh, I need to get a little more space. There we go. Oh, you're going to have to, I'm going to have to slide the whole system over here a little bit. There we go. Let me put them on your, they have to go on your temples. Okay, right there, good. Okay, if they start to get too loose, (laughs) no shock yet, no shock yet. The shock will come when you hear the question. I'm going to ask him about his love life. What love life? Oh, it doesn't matter. You say, oh, I don't have one. Oh, wait, we're going to ask who you would like to have one with. Okay, so anyway... Okay, so here, I need you to turn your wrist over. There you go. On the back of the wrist there. Okay, here we go. All right. Now, just sit, and there you go. Very good. All right, hold on. Okay. I think we're ready. All right. Let me go get my notes, because I need to ask the right question, the perfect question. All right, this is Isaac, and... Isaac, we've got you connected here. Here, let me just turn this to me a little bit. We're going to be doing some readings here. 
First of all, what is your full name? Isaac Michael Page. Okay. How old are you, Isaac? Seventeen. Seventeen. Oh, good. Okay. Um, what is your mother's maiden name? Babcock. When will you graduate high school? This year, 2022. Okay, everything's checking out good. All right, here's the question that I have for you next. Do you believe that God is real and in heaven today? Yes, sir. Hmm. Hold on, let me pause this a second. Do you believe that God is real, that he's in heaven today? I wonder, if you were connected to a lie detector test, a lie detector, how would you answer that question? And if you answer the question, do you believe that there would be any thing that might give away some doubt. I believe today that there's a lot of people, even amongst Christians today, that question the reality of God. I do. Even if it's just a little. I asked Isaac a very simple question, but let me tell you, that answer is not that simple if you don't have it settled. And sadly enough today, I believe that in America and around the world, especially in America right now, we have even Christians in churches across the country who might be a little bit unsure. Oh, I know that they know what the answer ought to be. I know that they believe that it ought to be clearly God exists, God is real, and God is on the throne in heaven. But I am concerned that sometimes that may not be the reality of it. That although they want to believe it with all their heart, there is a tinge of doubt or there's doubt within their heart. They say to themselves, I know that, I, I think I've seen evidence of God and I believe there should be and I've heard the preacher preach on it and I was raised in a home and my parents say they believe in God but there's something inside me that just doesn't want to get all in yet. I want to be in in a sense but I struggle just a little bit. Okay, you're on the lie detector test. You're, you're being tested now on a lie detector machine. And I mean, it's, it's a lot easier now than it used to be. And again, these aren't 100% accurate. It's probably 75% accurate based on the software. But let me say this. There's somebody giving the test, though, that is 100% accurate. And his name is God. And the question has to arise. The question's got to be asked. Here we are, living in the world in which we live, and we are supposedly Christians. We name the name of Christ, and yet maybe, just maybe... You even question the very reality of God. You say, well, that's impossible. Well, that's the concern, isn't it? Because if we struggle with the existence of God, how is it that we can know that we are in Christ Jesus? Listen, the goal of this message is not to get you to doubt something, a decision you've made in the past. But I'm going to say this. I believe so many people war with this issue. I believe so many are more like the man in Mark that say, I believe, but help thou mine unbelief. And may I say that that unbelief will hinder and hamper your ability to get close to the very God that you want to get close to if he exists. And it will keep you from experiencing the blessings that he has for you. Do you believe that God is real and in heaven today? Hey, listen, you say, I do have some doubts. I'll be honest with you. I do. Well, don't be honest with me. The first person you need to be honest with is God. Obviously yourself, but then God. So maybe today you're here, and maybe even as far as we're concerned, you are a great Christian. Man, I mean to tell you, you attend church consistently and faithfully. You have a heart for God, it seems. You even get involved in the church house. You're at the picnics and maybe you're teaching in Sunday school. You might even be out knocking doors. You could be playing a piano or singing a special. I don't know, but may I say this, you may have some doubts. And you know what? You can't just hide those doubts. You're going to have to face those doubts. Because there's going to come a time in your life, like that man did, where you're going to have to have that faith in God. You're going to need that strength that comes in knowing Him the way only you can, having a relationship with Him. 
Be honest and tell God. The Bible says in John 4, 24, God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Amen. You know what? I think sometimes we're not very honest with God. We don't tell God what we really think or how we really feel, even though he already knows. We somehow want to hide some of those things because we feel like saying it out loud or saying it to him would be exposing ourselves as not being so good. But God already knows our heart. God already knows what we're thinking. We've got to be honest with God. You cannot have a relationship with God. You can never get to know God unless you're honest. You can't even worship Him unless you're worshiping Him in spirit and in truth. So if you take truth out of it, you can't even worship God. You're struggling maybe with this idea, this thought, this reality of God, and you need to be honest and tell God that. But you also have to have a desire to find God. You need a desire to find Him. By the way, God wants you to find Him. In Proverbs chapter 8, verse 17, the Bible says, I love them that love me, and those that seek me early shall find me. Man, you've got to seek Him early. You can't wait till the end of your life. You can't just put Him off consistently. You don't know when life will end. You need to make sure you've got settled who is God and what He's all about, and is He real? And we got this stigma attached to our lives where we somehow think we'll be a bad person if we question the reality of God. Can I tell you, you know what that makes you? A person. That's right. That makes you normal. Do you know that in your flesh you can't help but question the reality of God? But you've got to get before God and be honest with God and say, I am struggling with this. I am really struggling. I believe in one sense, God, but there's a part of me that's struggling with your reality. I'm having a hard time believing in you the way I ought to. And when I think I do, then these doubts flood my mind. You've got to be honest with him, and then you have to say, but I want to know you and your reality. I don't want these doubts anymore. I want to have confidence that you're in heaven, that you're on the throne, that you are real. Those that seek me early shall find me. See, you can't forget that he will reveal himself if you will seek him. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. Turn there, would you please? Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. The Bible says, but without faith, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. Wow, wait a second now. There's more riding on this now. You mean I can't please God if I question his existence? I mean, I want to, and I'm going to try to do the right things just in the event that he is there. It's not enough. You've got to believe that he is. And notice what he says next. And that he is, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is. And that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Now I know it seems like kind of inconsistent in one sense. Well, I don't know that I actually, actually believe in God, but I'm going to go and pray to God. I know that does kind of seem weird, doesn't it? But when the prayer is reveal yourself to me, when the prayer is acknowledge your reality, the prayer is I want to know you exist. I don't want to question your, your presence and your realness, your genuineness, your reality. That's, a, that's, that's, that's something that God is more than happy to help you with. How's he, he knows already, right? But you need to know that, and you need to at least admit it to God, and then say, I want to know him in a very different way. I want to know without question that God is alive and well, and that he's real. And then seek him out with all your heart, and know that if you do that, he will reward you. How does he reward us? First, with that reality. There is real peace and comfort that comes in knowing that God is real. It lays the foundation for everything else that we believe and do in life. If we question the reality of God, it will affect every decision we make in the end. We've got to settle that. That must be first and foremost. Is there a God in heaven? 
You're on the lie detector and the questions being asked. You're not just around the table talking to your family. You're not just simply conversing with the pastor. You're not just at a door even claiming that you know the Lord. You're sitting here at a lie detector and it's going to reveal whether or not you genuinely mean it or not, whether it's sincere or not, whether or not you really believe God's real. You're going to be on that lie detector and you say, oh, I wouldn't want to do that right now. I'd be a little concerned it might reveal doubt in my life and I'd be embarrassed here in this place. Can I tell you that you may never have to be on this lie detector test, so to speak, but can I tell you this? The God in heaven already knows the answer. And boy, I'll tell you what, you need to settle that before you ever meet him in heaven. It'll be too late then. You say, what do I need to do? Man, I'd pray, and I'd say something like, God, you told me that I must worship you in spirit and in truth. So I'm going to be perfectly honest and tell you that I have doubts from time to time concerning your existence. You said that those who seek you early will find you, and so I'm seeking. I want to find you, so please reveal yourself to me. Be real in my life. Remove my doubts and replace them with confidence. I believe, but help thou mine unbelief. We could go through a litmus of or a, a, lit, a, a litany of, of reasons why we believe that God is real. We could look to the fact that logic tells us that God is real. I mean, we could basically look at just literally the universe itself, look at our world in which we live in, look at mankind themselves, and realize that it couldn't have just happened. It's funny for me, uh, I think about when I was just a youngster and, and how when I was in school as a teenager... You know, proponents of evolution contended that it wasn't a theory, it was fact. But it's interesting, isn't it? If evolution is described and explained to me as a teenager was indeed fact, as they contended, then why does the origin of the universe continue to change as new discoveries come to light? Well, how's it come it keeps changing? Well, where did we come from? Well, how did it all begin? Well, we're not convinced it's just a big bang anymore. There's other aspects of this now that we're going to concern ourselves with and look into and study. Well, why? If it was a fact back then, then it shouldn't be changing. Can I tell you what hasn't changed? God and His Word. That's still the same as it's been ever since it was put on paper, ever since it was already in heaven, the Bible says. Because all we have in our hands today is a copy of what is in heaven. Matter of fact, do you know there's never been an original on earth? The original's always been in heaven. This idea, well, we lost the originals thousands of years ago, so we don't know the authenticity and the reliability of the Word of God. You never had a, an original. They've always been copies of the original that is in heaven and that will be there forever and ever and ever and ever. That's why this book is just as inspired as it's ever been, because it's always been and always will be his word, whether it's in heaven or whether it's on earth. He's the one that takes care of this book. Logic tells us that God is real. I mean, when you see a painting, you know there's a painter. When you listen to a song, you know there was a composer. When you see a baby, you know there had to be a man and a woman that came together. Hey, listen, if God doesn't exist, where did this all come from? I mean, logic tells us, but science tells us that he's real. Science also does. I mean, consider the fact that the earth has the perfect atmosphere for life, that it's positioned from the sun at the exact right place. Consider that evolution focuses on mutations and changes from within and, 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 and from with, with, uh, without even, and, and it changes these existing organisms, but even then, evolution cannot explain the start of any living organisms from non-living material. How did life come out of no life? How did it just happen? It didn't. Do you know there are three billion pairs of DNA? Uh, they're actually, it's hard to say these words, they're so big because they want to throw us off, but nucleotides. There are three billion pairs of DNA nucleotides in every human cell. Every human cell. You know what that says to me? You are unique. You are, 
Well, I knew you're unusual, but you are unique. <laughs> do, you realize, do you realize that twins are different? They have their own personalities, their interests, their own special talents in many cases. Do you know that we breathe on an average of 12 to 20 breaths per minute? Our hearts beat 60 to 100 beats per minute. We do all of these things and we don't even have to think about it. Whether we're viewing rock formations in the Grand Canyon, uncovering fossils from ages gone by, or whether we're exploring the intricate workings of the human body, everything points to an intelligent designer. And that designer is none other than God himself. Do you know the Bible tells us God is real? In Romans chapter 1, verse 20, just look there real quickly because I think it's important to recognize this and see this. Romans chapter 1, verse 20. You doing all right up there, Isaac? I'm going to get to that question about who you like in the church. <laughs> Every teenager is a nightmare. He's just to the point now where he actually... Like they say, he's learned to like girls. It takes a while. You know how ridiculous, by the way, how, I'm just going to throw this in, this is free. How ridiculous is it for us to let a nine-year-old decide whether they're a boy or a girl when they haven't even hit puberty? This is ridiculous. It's funny. Do you know, they talked about that young, the young girl, that little girl that had been abused by that man and now has a baby and they're trying to use it to prove that we ought to have Roe Wade back in place again because a 10-year-old's pregnant with a child. That's alarming for all of us in the room. We're freaking out thinking about that alone. But let me say this. How's come that 9-year-old has to have a mother's approval before she can have an abortion, but she can get a sex change without it? Where's the common sense in the world we live in? There is no common sense. You take the Bible sense out of it, there's no common sense. Just thought I'd throw that in because I know I want to make friends and influence people. <laughs> Romans chapter 1, verse 20. Look what it says. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are what? Made even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. You know what he's saying? As you look around the world you live in, if you will look at it honestly, sincerely, and remove all the preconceived ideas, if you'll just see it for what it is, it can't help but remind you that there is a creator God. It will, who he is. He is tripartite even. We see that evidence of it in, our, 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 in the creation itself. In the beginning, God created. It's interesting when I think about this, the Bible starts in the beginning and points out God, right? See, the Bible starts in the beginning, God created. Do you know how it starts for us? Created, the creation, there has to be a God, and he was in the beginning. See, it all works the opposite way. <clears throat> God reveals to us how it came about, but then he reveals himself as we look back the other way. <coughs> Excuse me. If you want to know there's a God, you have to look back the other way. You have to get back to him. You look at his creation. <coughs> Excuse me, the devil's fight. <coughs> One of those tickles you just literally can't shake and it makes you choke until you almost, you know. Whew, had one of those the other day. Thought I was getting one. Aren't you lucky I didn't? <clears throat> They'd be calling 911 and Brother Mike and all these security guys would be up here hauling me away in a stretcher. <laughs> Romans 1.20 again, we, we look back, we see creation itself. Then we are reminded that there's a God, and, and we're, we're, we're convinced of it. We can't, and listen, don't think it was coincidental that the devil attacked creation. I mean, schools for, for how many years have been teaching our youngsters, our children, that there's no God? And how are they doing that? They first started by saying there's no creation, that there's no creator, that it came into existence on its own. All they did was undermine the reality of God. That's all they were really doing. 
I mean, this direction we're going in our country is going to communism. You know what communism is? Atheism. And there's no, it's not surprising why we're going the direction we're going because we've taken God out of our culture. We've taken him out of our society. But you know where it all began? We took him out of our lives. Listen, God is real, and we look around us in the creation and we see that. See, the Bible is very clear. Logic tells us there's a God. Science tells us the God. The, 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 uh, uh, God. the Bible tells us that God is real. Whew. It's funny, C.S. Lewis made this statement. He said, atheism turns out to be too simple. If the whole universe has no meaning, we should never have found out that it has no meaning. If it has no meaning, then we should have never found out it has no meaning. <laughs> it's just, I mean, that's pretty commonsensical. I mean, it, it just went over a lot of our heads, didn't it? But anyway, it, it makes sense. Okay, so the first question. Do you believe that God is real? If you were on the lie detector today, what would it reveal? Would it reveal doubts in your mind? Because if it would, you need to start digging into the Word of God. You need to make steps going to God and admitting that you are struggling with His reality. And you need to go to Him and beg Him to reveal Himself in your life and through the Word. Boy, we'll get to it in a minute, but there's a lot of things we need to do, obviously. But knowing that and being willing to embrace it and own it is the first thing. I think a lot of Christians don't deal with that. They try to put it out of their mind. Instead of facing the truth. And you cannot worship God except in spirit and in truth. Second question. Okay, Isaac, I'm going to get over there. Just a few to kind of set the stage again. Oh, I do not want to do this. Here we go. All right, we're back up. Is there a girl in the church that you like? <laughs> That's a good question, isn't it? Huh? Don't tell me who it is. Just, is there? Oh, yes. Any there. Any yeah, any girl. Any girl. Any girl. That, that you like more than the rest? Oh, yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. Does her name begin with an S? No. We're going to stop there for right now. I... It's getting heated up here. Okay. <laughs> okay. Number two, question number two. Are you totally convinced that the Bible is God's word from cover to cover? Yes, sir. Okay. Hey, that's a good question, isn't it? You know, we preach a lot out of this book. We talk a lot about the Bible, but the question is, do we really believe it is God's Word? From cover to cover. How many times have we questioned God's Word? Do you know that there are people that call themselves scholars and theologians who question the Word of God? They're supposed to be the most knowledgeable in the Bible. They're supposed to know more than anyone else. And yet they themselves don't even believe the book that they're studying is all God's Word. They think parts and pieces of it aren't really authentic or authoritative. That's ridiculous. Isn't that crazy? Why would you spend your life studying something that you're not convinced is true? Why do we, then, if we're not convinced? Are you 100% sure? Are you confident, without a doubt, that yes, what I hold in my hand is literally God's Word? Listen, if you're struggling with that first one, you may be struggling with the second, right? It's kind of hard to believe that this is God's Word if we're not 100% sure that there's a God. <laughs> That's why it's so important to lay that foundation, to know the reality of God, that He is real without question. And then comes the next one. Do you believe that the Bible is the Word of God from cover to cover? Whew. If you were on this machine, if you were hooked up, if you were the one being evaluated and the question was asked you, could you say emphatically, without question, yes, indeed, I believe that God's Word is indeed His Word. I believe that book that I hold in my hand, that I memorize, that I read, that I study, that I go to church and hear about, is God's Word without question, without question at all. 
You know what? That, I think that's probably not quite as popular even in the church as we'd like to believe. You see why I'm alarmed? You say, how do you know that? Because for years I struggled with the reality of God. I had to nail that down. I remember being a young man and thinking, man, I grew up hearing this stuff. I grew up being told there's a God. I grew up being told that God is on the throne. I grew up believing that he died, was buried, and rose again, and being told that's the way it is. And I even went to church, and I even made a profession of faith, and I did all these things. And yet in my heart of hearts as a young man, I had questions. You say, that make you a bad person? No, it made me a person. It made me normal. You're not bad because you question things. You're bad if you choose to disregard it and move forward and say, whatever. Why would you do that? You're only going to hurt yourself. You're not hurting me. That's a bad decision. Get it settled. So I started going to God, just like I told you, and saying, if you're there, prove it. You're in heaven, make it very clear to me. God, reveal yourself to me. I want to believe in you without question, but there's those doubts in my mind. I want to know without a doubt. God, I can't stand living like this. And the next one, of course, is the Bible. It's impossible to believe this is really all God's word, and it's without question His, if I don't even believe in Him. I had to be honest with myself. I had to be honest with God. I mean, if we truly believe that the Bible, the Bible says in Romans 10, 17, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You know, people say, what do I do with a family member or friend that doesn't believe in the Bible? Tell them to read it. (laughs) Tell them to read it. Get them in it. One of the most... uh, Hopeful things I ran into in door knocking in the last months has been a a, a Muslim man that I ran into, that Sherry and I ran into door knocking, that said that he is studying the book of Matthew. And I thought, praise God. We talked a little bit about that and the need to continue in those, those studies, that arena. And boy, I tell you what, I was encouraged because I thought, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You know what he's going to find before it's over with? God, the real God, the true God. You know what he's going to figure out? That the Bible is the word of God. And then you know what he's going to figure out? How to have a relationship with him. Hey, listen, if we truly believe that the Bible is the word of God, it wouldn't make sense not to read it then. If we really believe it, it wouldn't make sense not to apply it. If we really believe that it's the word of God, then it wouldn't make any sense not to share it. See, I, I wonder sometimes if the reason why we're not all in is because we're not all in. Because we still question the reality of God from time to time. If God was real, why did he let this happen to me? What? Well, see, there's questions, aren't there? But we... We're not usually honest about that. Sure, I believe in God. I just got upset. Well, are you just upset or do you really struggle with the reality of God? Settle that first. And then you better figure out, once you get that settled, you'll be able to say, I believe God's word is indeed God's word. This book, the Bible, is God's word. Last questions. Question. Oh, good. Ooh, one, two. Okay, finally, we're going to close this down here. All right. Next question. Does Daniel like a girl in the youth group? <laughs> Daniel's in right over there. No, he's not. Uh, not. Not now. Not yet that you're aware of. Oops. Hold on. You sure that... Oh, okay. All right. Final question now. Okay. Here's number three. Okay. Here we go. 
I've already asked you two questions. One, I asked you, do you believe? And I'm trying to find the question because I want to say it exactly like I did. Wow, where's my questions? There it is. Do you believe that God is real and in heaven today? I asked you, number two, are you totally convinced that the Bible is God's word from cover to cover? And now, last question. Here it is now. You ready? Do you believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that you will be in heaven when you die? Yes, sir. Hmm. You didn't even know oh, that's straight line there. That's no, that's. You're on the lie detector. And the question is, do you believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that you'll be in heaven when you die? Okay, now listen, if, if you don't, it's going to show up. You might as well be honest about it. You might as well come clean. How would you have to answer if you wanted to have a truthful answer? For years, I, I believed, I, listen, I, I, I believed I was saved for years. But I would get these doubts from time to time. You ever get those? Don't answer. Of course, you probably have. But then again, some of you have never had those doubts. I did. And I had received Christ, supposedly I trusted him as a youngster, and I grew up, and I got away from God a little bit, and I came back, and there were issues in my life, and I was struggling with some things. Man, I had some questions. And then I got some things right. I even got into the ministry, and honestly, I was preaching the truth, and I believed that salvation was by grace through faith. I knew that only Christ could save, and I would lay in my bed even at night sometimes and say to myself, God, if I don't know you, then save me right now. I did everything you said to do, Lord. I know I did. But if I'm not saved, save me now. You say, you are out of your mind. I don't think I'm as out of my mind as many believe because I think a lot of you have done the same thing. Because you know why? Because we're human. It was in 2005, in the month of January, that I went to a youth rally with some young people in our church, just a small group, a, a group of, of young people and uh, the youth leader and so forth, and we made our way up to Pennsylvania. It was a special kind of a deal. We sat there and listened to a message, and they had this... Uh, they had this uh, uh, skit and people were going down through the baptistry and the baptistry was like fire shooting out of it all over the place and people were screaming and they're showing hell and all of that stuff and man, I'm telling you what, I'm like, man, you get them, Lord, you get them, Lord. And I didn't deal with doubts all the time and it might be six months. I even never had a doubt. Six months, I'm fine. Then all of a sudden, a little doubt comes. What's that for? Where did that come from? Right? You, you know what I'm talking about. I'm sitting there, and I'm not thinking one thing about not being saved, not a bit. Matter of fact, I'm going, Lord, Lord, if there's any young people in this room, you need to, you need to, you need to save them. They need Christ. They've got to be saved. And I told you, I, just every once in a while, those little doubts would pop up in my mind. And every once in a while, I'd even lay in bed and say, Lord, if I'm not saved, I'm asking you to come into my life right now and save me. I know what the Word of God says. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I'd do that. And that day, probably three, four hundred teenagers in that room, we had 20 of our kids, just 20 of our kids, that, that group that we'd taken. And there, sitting beside my wife, the Holy Spirit said, this may be your last chance. Get saved. And I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. Now, Lord... I dealt with this a long time ago, back in 1996, back when the church was running about 30, 40, and now we're running over 300. Why now? Oh, whoa, 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 yeah. You think it's tough? Oh, I know what it is. And I thought the same thing I tell you all the time. If you don't have it settled, I wouldn't go to hell for anybody. And I said, I'm going to have to take my own advice right now. 
And I still remember, I nudged my wife and said, I got to settle it. I don't even know what, she, I don't know if she even knew what I was talking about. She's like, you better do it then. <laughs> I get up, I call my youth director up, I pull him over, I say, hey. He said, what do you need, preacher? I said, I want you, I said, let's go to the altar. I said, I got to get saved. He's like, what? I said, yeah, take your Bible, turn over to Romans chapter 10, verse 13 for me. And he's like, but, 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 I, I, he couldn't find it. I said, forget it, I can. <laughs> I turned to Romans 10, listen, you don't think I was already saved at that very moment? If I, I opened that book, I got down, I, I said, at least read it, okay? He read it, and I said, okay. I bowed my head, and I said, okay, I'm going to publicly accept Christ now. I'm not going to be ashamed of him because I kept trying to do it without being public with it. Even though I thought, I, honestly, I had no reason to believe I wasn't saved, but I just thought there was doubts all the time, right? You know what I learned that day? You know what I learned that helped me? And it's helped so many others. The devil may tell you you're not saved and try to get you to doubt it, but he will never tell you to get saved. So if you hear somebody telling you to get saved and settle it, that ain't the devil talking. That isn't even your own, because I didn't want to have to do that publicly. That was the Holy Spirit speaking. You can know for sure heaven's your home. Do you realize in the book of 1 John chapter 5, verse 11, the Bible says, and this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. I went back to church on Sunday, and I preached my testimony. Do you know they didn't vote me out? Instead, 43 people walked the aisle and got saved. We had over 30-some baptisms that day. The first baptism was me, and then I baptized the rest that night. We had seven young people in Bible college, in a local Bible college. They went to school, and you know what they were told? Your pastor needs to step down. He's a novice. He just got saved. He's a novice. He needs to step down. Here's what I told him. You tell them this, and I said, this is not a prideful thing. I'm just saying, you need to tell them this is factual. If an unsaved man can build a church to over 350, how much better will he do being saved? Now listen, I don't, to this day, I don't know when I get to heaven, I can't say 100% sure that I wasn't saved at 12, but I know for a fact I was saved on January the 15th, 2005. I have no question. You know that I've never doubted it since. I made an adult decision that day, and I know without a doubt I'm on my way to heaven. Let me ask you, how confident are you? Could you pass the test? Do you believe in the reality of God? How would it turn out? God is real, and he's on the throne. Do you believe that? Can you say that without a question? Number two, I believe that the Bible is the word of God from cover to cover. And finally, number three, do you believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that you'll be in heaven when you die? If you believe there's a God in heaven and you believe that the Bible's the word of God, then let me tell you what, it would be totally crazy not to settle your soul salvation. You've got everything you need other than just a profession of faith, other than just coming to him and admitting you're a sinner and guilty and deserving hell, but instead you want him to pay the price as he already did on Calvary, and you want it applied to your life. You want to receive and accept him. He died for you 2,000 years ago, and he shed his precious, perfect blood, and he rose again the third day. Why? So you could be saved. He did that all for you. If you could get to heaven being good enough, why did he send Jesus, his son, to die in your place, to die in my place? Let's get honest with God. Let's get on that old lie detector and let's make sure that what we say we believe, we truly believe. May we address and deal with these doubts that we have so that we don't have to be haunted by them daily. Be honest with God. Take steps to find him. And that means pray, get in the Bible, be faithful in God's house where you can hear about him. Ask him to reveal himself to you. 
And straightway the father of the child cried out and said it with tears, Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. Let's get to a no doubt belief. No question belief. Let's not have to pray, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. Let's be able to say, Lord, I believe. Whether it's that he's real, that the Bible is his word, and that we are on our way to heaven. No doubt. No doubt. Father, we come to you. We thank you for this time we've had together, and we just pray, Lord, that you would speak to our hearts again. We thank you for taking the time to die, to spend etern- to, to, to take away our sin by, by yielding yourself, by giving yourself to die on a cross to pay for it. Lord, we know that we're guilty. We know that we're sinners. Every day we look in the mirror, we can't help but realize that, Lord, there's areas we need to clean up and get right. But, Lord, the truth is we can never clean up enough to earn your favor or to become your child. Only you can do that in our life. Lord, I'm asking you now, Father, just to be with each and every one in this room and help us, Lord, to really be honest with ourselves. Help us to really answer the question from the deep within and not to simply brush over it. There might be those in our midst, Lord, that are struggling with the reality, your reality. Help them to be honest and begin on a, to get on a quest now to find your reality, to even approach their pastor and say, here, maybe you can help me with that. Lord, the Bible's the word of God. Help us, Lord, to not question that, knowing that you're real, then your word is real. And then, Lord, help us to settle your salvation in our own lives. If we know you exist, we know your word is true, then, Lord, help us to receive and accept Jesus as our Savior as the Bible commands. Lord, help us to settle our soul salvation because you said these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. We want to know that. We want to settle it once and for all. We want to have it settled. And Lord, if the Holy Spirit is convicting and moving in lives, may it be settled even this morning. We'll thank you. We'll praise you. In Christ's name, amen. Let's all stand. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Maybe you're a lady today and you don't have it settled. You don't know for sure if you died, you'd go to heaven. You can settle that right now. You say, I believe in God. I do. I, I, the best I know how, I, I do. I believe in God. The best I know how, I believe that the Bible is the word of God. The best I know how, it is. I, I, well, then you need to get saved today if you don't know Christ. You need to receive and accept the Lord Jesus as your Savior. Won't you settle that today? You come to an altar maybe and tell God, listen, God, I... I want to believe in you. I I, I do, but I don't. I'm struggling. I'm kind of like that man. I believe, help thou mine unbelief. I want to get this nailed down. I don't want to be in turmoil. I don't want to have to deal with those, that confusion in my heart. You can settle that today and, or you can can begin a, a journey to find him. If you're struggling with the word of God, just simply go to the word of God. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If you died today, are you 100% sure heaven would be your home? You can know that. You don't have to ask the question. You don't have to wonder. You can have it settled. But you got to deal with this issue. you got to know there's a God. You've got to believe the Bible's the Word of God. And then make a decision on behalf of Christ. Come to Him and ask Him to save you, to forgive you, to come into your life. Be your Savior. I know you're real, and I want you in my life. I need you that died for me on Calvary to come into my life to save me, to forgive me. I can't do this on my own. Only you can do it in me.
There's still time this morning if you have not made that decision. If you've not accepted Christ as your Savior, if you can't say without a shadow of a doubt that I am for sure on my way to heaven, we have gentlemen down here, we have ladies down here, there are those that are already being dealt with out of the Word of God, settling things in their heart. I've already had one young lady come and settle her soul's salvation. Maybe that's you, and you're still fighting it in your seat. You don't know it for sure, but you want to get it settled. Would you make your way down this morning and somebody can show you from the Word of God? The Bible tells us that now, now, is the day of salvation today. We have several that are being prepared this morning to be baptized as well. They've accepted Christ as their Savior already, and they say, you know, Lord, because of what you've done in our hearts, we want to do a, have a testimony, a public testimony, that we've placed our faith and trust in you, and they're going to be baptized this morning. It doesn't help them get to heaven anymore, like the thief on the cross. Their soul salvation is secured, but it publicly testifies of their obedience in following Christ. We're excited about that as well. At any point this morning, even after the last prayer is said, if you don't have that soul salvation settled, please just get a hold of somebody on your way out. We'll be glad to show you from the Bible how you can know that for sure. You can be seated this morning. As I mentioned, we do have a few preparing for baptism. And so even just while you're seated there, folks are being dealt with. Please be courteous of that. And you could just be praying that the Lord would continue to work throughout this service and um, we'll prepare for those baptisms. All right, this is Katie, and she's trusted Jesus as her Savior. Amen. We're excited about that. She's a precious young lady. And Katie, based upon your profession and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, my sister, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, buried in the likeness of his death. Straight back, sweetheart. Raised in the likeness of his resurrection. Right back to where you came, okay? Good girl. Yeah. There you go. That's good. All right, Rachel, come on up. You're good. Be very careful. That could be slick now, really slick, okay? This is Rachel. She's put her personal faith and trust in Christ. Is there anything you'd like to share today? <laughs> I put you on the spot, didn't I? Well, it was a wonderful day when she put her faith and trust in Christ, and we're excited to be able to just be a part of this step. Listen, baptism doesn't save us. It's a step of obedience, and what a wonderful decision she's making today. It's so good to have family and friends here supporting her in that decision as well. Just like that, underneath, you get right. There you go. All right, Rachel, based upon your profession and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, my sister, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, buried in the likeness of his death. Straight back. Raised in the likeness of his resurrection. Amen. Thank you very careful. Thank you very much. Be careful as you go up there. Give me a slip. All right, got it? 
Very good. That's where we slick here too. There are a couple more coming up for baptism. You might have seen some of the Spanish church come in in the back here. And uh, Brother Rigo uh, leads the Spanish ministry here, and they have several being baptized uh, from that uh, class this morning. Amen. Este es nuestro hermano Abel. Él recibió a Cristo y lo vamos a bautizar. Así que, hermano, siéntate aquí, siéntate. Hermano, por tu testimonio y profesión en Cristo Jesús, te bautizo en el nombre del Padre, del Hijo y del Espíritu Santo, sepultado con Cristo en las aguas del bautismo. Levantaos para caminar una vida nueva en Cristo Jesús, Señor nuestro. Hermano Ever, por tu uh, profesión y testimonio en Cristo Jesús, te bautizo en nombre del Padre, del Hijo y del Espíritu Santo, sepultado con Cristo en las aguas del bautismo. Levantaos para caminar una vida nueva en Cristo Jesús, Señor nuestro. Hey, we, we have another one now. That's good. Yeah, they're, they're preparing. Uh, Miss Wendy Smith came down this morning, and she accepted Christ as her Savior, and she's going to follow the Lord in believer's baptism, and so they're preparing right now for that. Just rejoicing, and the Lord's working, amen? amen. And uh, it's what a wonderful thing. I know a little, maybe a little longer in our service this morning, but just thank, so thankful for the Lord working in our hearts today.
Do you want to say anything, Wendy? All right. Well, this is the second time around, but like Pastor said, sometimes we just have to settle it. And I've had a lot of doubts. I was raised Catholic, and my parents are still Catholic, and they keep telling me I was baptized a long time ago when, as a baby. Why do I need to do this? Well, this pastor keeps telling us that we have to, we believe, and I thought I believed 10 years ago when I first came here. I thought I had settled it then, but I've been having doubts and having doubts and having doubts. And my church family here has been praying for me and praying for me, and I didn't have any answers with my health issues, and now all of a sudden my church family started praying for me. And now I know what's going on, and it's early enough. I can do things about it. So I am settling. I feel I'm working in me, and here I am. Amen. 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 <laughs> that's good. No, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah, here. That's okay. <laughs> you go ahead and grab my hand here Oops. and underneath there. There you go. There you go. Okay, Wendy, based upon your profession and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, my sister, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Buried in the likeness of his death. Straight back. Raised in the likeness of his Amen. resurrection. Amen. No, you're right. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord for that. That's awesome stuff. Go ahead and stand with me this morning if you would. I want to remind you again about making your own profession of faith, getting that settled in your, in your life as well. And uh, again, if you have not had that settled... Please talk to someone this morning. You'll see even Pastor probably out in that lobby as, we, as you walk out today and just let him know. Lean over and whisper, say, I need to get that settled, and we'll be glad to show you from God's Word. We'll be back this evening at 6 o'clock for our evening service. I want to invite you to be a part of that. Rejoicing also with Anna Weiser this morning. She accepted Christ and got that settled. Congratulations, Anna. Let's give that, yes, praise the Lord for that. And uh, just a uh, good, good uh, morning today. Six o'clock this evening, evening service. Also, you'll see as you walk out these doors right here, there's a table out in the lobby. There's a ladies' meeting tomorrow at 6.30 p.m., and I want to invite you to register and be a part of that. Great time of fellowship here at the church, and uh, it, it'd be a great time for you to get to know some of the other ladies and be strengthened from God's Word. And, uh, and so they always do a wonderful job with it, and I want to encourage you. Get registered this morning for that, and uh, you'll see there's several other things there in your bulletin. Um, so make sure you make note of these activities, things coming up here at the church. Let's have a word of prayer, and we'll be dismissed this morning. Father, we do thank you for our time together today. Lord, thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for your love, your patience with us. And Lord, I do pray that you would continue to work even in our hearts and lives as we leave this morning. Lord, if there is someone here this morning who doesn't have it settled, I pray that today would be their day of salvation as well. May they not leave this place without knowing that heaven is their home. Lord, I pray that you would bless the church family as we go. There are so many in this world who are lost and unsure of their eternal security. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to go in boldness to preach the gospel, that those that are lost would know of the eternal hope they can have through Jesus Christ our Lord. Father, I pray that you would bless us as we go, bring us back safely this evening to once again worship you and to learn of you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.